I just want to say thank you to each of you that are here. I see some new faces and hope that I get to meet you after the service. I'd love to connect with you afterwards. If, you're, if this is your very first time, make sure to stop by our Connect table. We have a gift for you out there. Um, love to give that to you, so stop by and grab that. And It's got some information in there uh, about our church. and um, it, We're not in competition with other churches. We're in this together. We're one church across this nation and across this world. And we need to work together, and so, but we're about helping you find the right community in the family for you. Um, it's my prayer that if you show up here at E3, you find an authentic group of people who f- are engaging in our community and in meeting real needs. That's our prayer. We want to see that become a reality and um, just equipping people to be real with God and be loved by a real God and are empowered by the hope of God. That's, that's, my, that's my hope um, today. So um, I just want to start off today and ask a couple questions. I want to start off with this question. How many of you love waiting on things? No hands? All right, all right. How many of you cannot stand waiting on something, right? Yeah, I, I am uh, I'm a very patient person. Just come ride with me on the roads. Um, it's great. Um, my wife's like this, or like white knuckling it all the time. But uh, but uh, waiting is hard this time of year. Um, there is this anticipation for the gifts to arrive, right? There's this anticipation. I was talking to some of the, our little kids this morning. They walked in. I'm like, "You love this season?" They're like, "Yeah." And I'm like, "What are you excited about?" It's like getting gifts. And I was like, "Of course you are." And loved hearing their their gifts that they're excited about. Um, but there's this anticipation of what will unfold this Christmas season. And uh, many of you are waiting for that Amazon truck to show up with that gift that we know is just going to be a gift that brings so much joy. It's going to just change things. However, what I know about waiting is it requires something significant. It requires something that we love to pray for, patience. Like, we, we have created, I don't know about each of you, but patience is something that I don't pray for anymore. Because when I pray for it, God makes sure that I get something that's going to create some pra- patience in my life and help me learn how to be patient. And so I don't pray for patience. Um, I probably should more, but I don't want that, right? You see, we don't like to wait on things, and we live in a society where we are so busy with so much, and we expect things right, right away, right? What used to take seven to ten business days to arrive, next day delivery, if it doesn't happen, we're losing our mind. <laughs> like, come on, why isn't this here? You said it would be here tomorrow, Amazon. And we are constantly inventing things that are helping us get it the next day. Then we're upset. If we don't have access right now to the information we need, we're frustrated because we have to now spend time to find the information. Organizations all over are making millions on you and I's inability to be to wait. We think quicker outcomes are going to make life better, don't we? If I have it right now, if things are a little more efficient, I, I can't, I don't know about you guys, but I can't stand inefficiency. Like, it just distracts me. I'm just like, that could happen so much more. And then I make a bigger mess out of it, and I'm like, wait, Jesus, I did that? Oh, shoot, now I got to learn, right? One of those things I can't stand is when I go to watch something on Prime Video or Netflix, and I get this emblem right here. <laughs> yeah, you relate with me? I'm like, I'm like in that zone and I'm watching the game or I'm watching a movie and it's like all of a sudden I'm like ah right so today you're like what does this have to do with what Jesus says Jesus has a lot to say about it and today I titled my sermon this patiently preparing patiently preparing it's my goal to challenge us to recognize the reason for the advent season We've been focusing on that as a church, is what does Advent really mean? What does Advent 
have to do with my Christian walk, and, it, and it's so valuable, it's so important, and I went for years, I told you guys this, I went for years going through the Advent season having no idea about Advent, and I thought, this is something, as a teaching team, we were like, this is something we want our congregation to understand, we want our people to understand. It might look different than how you have normally seen it, and we're focusing on Advent for a specific reason. The word Advent means something new is arriving or has arrived. The whole point of Advent is to spend several weeks preparing for Christmas, not just celebrating Christmas. It's so easy to just wait for that day and it's like, what's going to happen on Christmas Day? And then Christmas Day happens and we're like, that was chaotic. That was I'm so glad that's behind me. Finally, a new year is here. Right? You relate to that? And it's my goal today to help us stop and take a look back and help us to appreciate this season and look back to Jesus' first coming as a Savior and a look forward to Jesus' second coming and his return. It's about stepping into the shoes of the Israelites Longing and crying out for the Messiah to come. It's about reflecting on our sin and shortcomings and our need for a Savior. How I love that song, the way the song we just sang, how it reflected on that. It's about looking around at our broken world and hoping for the second coming of Jesus, but at the same time being patient for Him to return. And once we get to Christmas Day, the celebration of Jesus' birth and the why we celebrate it becomes that much more spectacular and meaningful because we understand the why. Church, let's not just rush through the season. Every one of your lives matters and every one of you are designed for a purpose and you're created for something powerful. And my hope today is that what we look at in scripture will help you see how do I patiently prepare for what Jesus is doing you see the reality is this we all have things in our life right now going on that feel like that emblem that feel like things are just waiting and spinning and we don't know what's on the other side of it There's this anticipation of, okay, what picture or what thing is going to show up next? And we feel that sense of urgency and anticipation inside of us for what is Jesus doing on the other side of what I'm experiencing right now? We're waiting for the results of what we have signed up for. We're waiting patiently for God to deliver on what he said he would do. We are waiting patiently for God to show us what's next. But here's my question for us. Are we waiting patiently? Or do we give up and we bail and say, oh, it's not going to load. I'm going to go do something else. I don't like to wait. And so how should I wait? And what can I learn in the waiting You see, I believe this, God is like that emblem. He's downloading something new to us during the season of anticipation. He's doing a new thing in us if we will learn to lean in and listen to him in the season. We often call out to God, God, where are you? We are wanting wanting for him to show up right now in the middle of our circumstances and we're trying to be patient in whatever is going on in our lives, but we don't always understand God's timing. But God always has a plan in the process, and my hope is to encourage you with this today. We hear God is always working behind the scenes, but is he? We hear God is doing a deeper work that we can always see, but is he? Maybe you're like me, you have those people that walk up to you and say, Brian, just be patient, wait on the Lord. Ah, stop, right? Like, don't say that one more time to me. Be patient, okay, okay. I will. As I look at my kids, and it's like, just be patient. And it's like, yes, sir, okay, I guess I will. Because I'm being patient. Okay, sorry, I digress. But today I want us to look at James 5. And James 5 is a, 
a scripture verse that is uni- church universal all across the world is studying together, and it's one of the verses in the Advent season that I want us to lean into because the reason I love James 5 is because I have a love-hate relationship for James 5. I don't like to read it, but yet I know that I need to read it many times. But James 5 has so much packed into it that I want us to understand the value behind it, and I want us to I'm just going to share something that God said to me as I was reading this and preparing for this day. As I was reading this passage, I was like, this is the one I want to lean into because God began to speak some things to me that hopefully will be helpful to you. And here's what I want you to lean into, is I don't want you to lean into the don'ts. I want you to lean into the invitation that Jesus is inviting you to. A lot of times we see be patient as another thing I have to do. And what I want us to see is the invitation Jesus and his word is inviting us into. Can you just pray, for, pray with me? God, I just pray right now that if people under the sound of my voice don't hear me speaking, that they will genuinely just hear you say something to them. And that whatever I say today, dear God, I, I, I pray that I have walked up here And I'm not standing in my shoes saying my things, but God, that your voice will speak. So God, I'm I'm inviting you right now. I'm asking right now that your spirit will just slow me down, help me to hear you, as I try to share something that I feel like you've said to me. God, you know every life. I don't know every story sitting here in front of me or watching online. And you know every person's story and their journey and how this is going to communicate. And so I'm asking that your spirit will be made known, and God, that we will hear your invitation to how you want to teach us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. James 5, 7 through 10 says this, be patient, be patient, and it can be hard to get past those first two words. What does that mean? He said, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. It's like, okay, what does this look like? And for me, I just immediately kind of went to something that related to, to my journey. My grandpa and grandma are farmers, and I got some pictures of my grandpa and grandma here that I want to show you. These are my cousins. My grandpa's on the far right, me and my cousins. I'm, I'm there in the middle, man. Don't I? It, I look look a lot bit better there, but, um, but this was a farm that we got to be on, and I've got a picture of me on a tractor here. My grandpa had me come out, and he's like, Brian, I want you to, I need you to clean the whole interior of the tractor out, and so this day, I was patiently scrubbing the tractor, and I completely detailed the inside of that, and there was many times on the farm with grandpa and grandma that I experienced something significant. I experienced, watched farmers who were tending to the fields and manicuring the fields and making sure the fields were prepared. I many times would go out onto the farm and with my grandpa and he'd always throw me the keys. I was like, I never ever will forget, I was like 11 years old and he tosses me the keys. He's like, jump in Brian. And I'm like, he's like, no, you drive us. And I'm like, grandpa, I don't know how to drive. And he's like, You're all, you'll be all right. We'll be fine. I was I was like, what in the world? I, now as a parent, I'm like, I don't know how he did that. But, um, but I watched my grandpa just throw me the keys and I jump in the truck and I could barely see over the truck and I'm driving down the dirt roads and we drive out by a field and we hop out and we grab, grab the shovel and he grabs several um, corrugating hoses or uh, pipes and, and he gets up there, shows you how much I'm on the farm, right? And he gets over there and he, he starts making sure the water is set to where it's watering the fields from the irrigation ditches and then he tells me he said Brian grab that shovel over there and I grabbed the shovel and we walked down this field and he starts walking forever and I'm like where are we going we're like going down this field forever and he's following the water path and he goes down and finds where gophers are destroying this field and he began, we began taking the shovel and we began clearing the path again and creating rows between the crops so that it could get the proper 
water that it needed. And I watched my grandpa as he patiently, persistently, just took care of the fields and prepared them. But he was preparing the fields for something significant. You see, he had planted potatoes in that field. And we were expecting for potatoes to be there several months down the road. There was an anticipation in that season of him never knowing whether something was going to destroy the crop or whether he would actually get some fruit from it. That he would actually get that potato and pull it out of the ground and it would be what it was being prepared to be. Church, many of us are in that season. We might be in a season where there's this situation where we don't know what God is doing, we don't know how he's preparing us, we don't know how he is trying to provide the water to, to water our life circumstance. The situation that we are going through, he is preparing us for something great. He's preparing us for him to return. You see, we want things to happen right now And Jesus many times looks at us and says, be patient. Verse 8, you too be patient and stand firm. Stand firm. I highlighted those words. And I started reflecting on what that means. Because it says be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. What does that mean? I don't know about you, but I grew up in a couple churches where um, I, I learned some amazing things, okay, from some of my churches. But I grew up with some pastors that literally freaked me out. Jesus is returning, you better be ready. Oh, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready, maybe. Um, to where I was constantly praying every night, Jesus, I hope everything's right because if you return, I'm scared to death. But I want you to hear something today. Jesus doesn't want you to be afraid. He wants you to be excited about his return. And when things are right and you're prepared and things are in place with him, there's this sense of anticipation and excitement about the Lord coming back and that his coming is near. And I wonder what something in your life right now that you might be waiting for. What is something in your life that you are experiencing where you're, you're finding yourself waiting and anticipating and you want to know what's on the other side, but you just don't know? What are you waiting on? What are those things you are hoping might be something of good? Like my grandpa in that field anticipating a good crop that year. What is it in our lives that there's an anticipation for? When we think of our lives, what are we tending to make sure the water is getting to those areas we need to? And here's something I want you to think about. Too often, our commitment to convenience is killing our commitment to Jesus. If you get nothing else out of this message, remember that. We can quickly become convenience-type believers, and if we don't get the convenience we need, we bail on Jesus. How often? We want the quick fix. What are you committed to is a question I want to ask you. We want it now and struggle to wait. How often have we said this? I can't read my Bible because I just don't have time. I've been guilty of that. That's not a derogatory statement at you because our world and our society is constantly bombarding us for our time that you can't wait. You can't wait. Church, waiting and patience is a discipline to learn. Learning to be still and stop and say, I'm going to be patient and trust the Lord in this. This morning we were having team chapel and in our team chapel one of our volunteers spoke up and said, I'm, I'm, God is good and I'm seeing breakthrough in my life because I've been intentional to make sure of the time no matter what's going on. I promise you, you will not be disappointed whenever you take the time, and wait on Jesus? Do we fill our lives with second best because we can't wait? Things aren't happening fast enough in our time? Or do we look to him to fill us with his best while we wait? Do we want water? Do we want nourishment? Do we want to be filled? Jesus is inviting us to stand 
firm and be patient and wait on him. The Lord's coming is near. Then when things aren't going well, we wonder why. And when I can't wait and I can't be patient, what do we do? We turn to grumbling. We immediately start taking it out on everybody else around us because things aren't happening the way that I want it to. Verse 9 tells us that. He goes right into it. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. How often I can't be patient, I get anxious, I get excited to make things happen right now, and then whenever it's not happening, I take it out on those around us. I think James... I think the author here is actually looking at this and helping us understand. Look, I know this is a natural reaction. It's a natural reaction to turn and start grumbling about what isn't instead of focusing on what is. That's normal. That's human for us, right? So often when we are struggling to be patient, we then take it out on others and life isn't going well. And I'll never forget this story. Same grandpa who tossed me the keys trusted me with his truck, drove me out into the field, took me on another trip one time. I was at the, I was at the um, farm, and my grandpa, my grandpa passed away a few years ago, and he always hated me telling this story. But I told him, Grandpa, this is the best story. This is the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. And the reason he hated it, he's like, he was a loving man. He was a, a man who cared so much, so deeply for people. My grandpa drives me out to the farm one day and I was grumbling and complaining or something at grandma's and I was hungry and like grandpa come on this isn't happening fast enough he's like all right get in the truck let's go and I thought we were going to like ice cream A&W always took me to A&W ice cream and I'm like yeah here we go and he drives me up on the hill and one of his other fields and we get into this well manicured well produced cornfield with all the corn stalks and he's like before we go anywhere, Brian, he's like, grab that shovel. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like thinking we're going to go fix some water again. And he said, Brian, I want you to start here. And he said, I want you to go down through this entire row, and I want you to find every weed, and I need you to pull every weed that's down through there. And then I want you to come back and come down the same row, and we need to weed this field. And this is like a five-acre field. And I'm going... Grandpa, we'll be here all day. And I start complaining. He said, get to work. Yes, sir. And I'll never forget when Grandpa looked at me and said, I know what you need, Brian. Be patient. There's work to be done. There's things that are, need to be in place. And he let me walk through Every row. I can't stand cornfields to this day. <laughs> the itchiness of those things. I had a short sleeve shirt on. There's a reason farmers wear long sleeves all the time. And I had a short sleeve shirt on, and I'm going through those corn stalks, and they're scratching me, and I'm just like, this is the stupidest thing ever. And I'm shoveling. I probably butchered some of the corn. And, but I, I was hoeing away at that cornfield, and I get back, and I, I'm... I get back and Grandpa goes, Brian, grumbling doesn't get you anything. I've never forgot it. And I've thanked my, I thanked my Grandpa to the day he passed away. Grandpa, I know you don't like this story, but it taught me something significant. You taught me that grumbling gets me nowhere. I know I was hangry. I, know, I probably did need food. I get hangry. I tell people all the time, don't meet me at 11 o'clock, all right? Meet me at 11 o'clock, you normally get the hangry, Brian. Now you all know, okay? It's like, okay, no, duly noted. Um, and so I find myself in those seasons, but my grandpa reminded me, it gets me nowhere. Why does this matter? Don't grumble against others. It's not their fault. But at verse 10, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. 
You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. And I highlighted this. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. If you don't know the story of Job, Job's story was he lost everything. Job was faithful to God. He had done nothing wrong. And in Job's story, Job loses his family. He loses his property. He loses everything financially. He was very well off. And everything went upside down for Job. And his wife turns and looks at him and goes, turn and curse God. And he said, I won't. And Job was faithful. And the writer turns and reminds us to look at Job's perseverance. And church, I want to encourage us today, if you're going through something today, if you're experiencing something that it's difficult to wait on, I just want to invite you during this season of anticipation, during this season of waiting of what Jesus, Jesus is going to come back, Jesus has been born, during this season I want you to remember, be patient. God is preparing you for something great. There's something valuable he's going to be doing. How do we say someone is good or compassionate or merciful when we have lost everything? How often do we trust God only if he shows up when he says he will? Our hope is not of this world. You see, there have been seasons when my grandpa spent hours in the field, and I remember him and grandma talking about this. There were seasons where they spent hours taking care of the field, and they lost the whole field. A storm comes through and destroys the crops. My grandpa could have turned and cursed God. He could have turned and said, this is your fault. Why'd you do this? But he was reminded of who the provider was. He always came back, maybe not always understanding in those seasons, but patiently waiting. God is the one who provides. I'm going to trust him. Jesus is patient with us. He's compassionate to us. He could have, my grandpa could have quit farming and he could have given up to it, but his dependence wasn't on the provision, but the provider. And I'm And God says, I'm coming, but I'm patient for those who aren't ready yet. Church, sometimes we're just like, man, I wish Jesus would just return in the middle of what I'm going through, right? (laughs) I got a few amens, yeah. It's like, yeah, right now, right now. And sometimes in those seasons, like, Jesus, I just want you to come back. Can you just come and heal this land and heal everything that's going on? And Jesus says, I'm doing a new thing. I'm restoring something. I've got more work to be done. And I think about that as I think about the lives who don't know Jesus yet. And I think about Jesus being patient and his grace and mercy and compassion on those who are not ready yet. You see, we may want Jesus to return, but he's being patient so that the greater fruit will be produced. You see, I could have walked out into the field of my grandpa's potato field and just uprooted what was already being developed and said, I'm hungry now, I'm going to eat the potato now. I'll never forget another story when my grandpa, I was hungry again and we were out and it was harvest season and he walks out in the potato field and and he he reaches down and he pulls this potato up out of the ground. And I'm like, Grandpa, what are you doing? And he's like, Brian, you're hungry? I'm like, yeah. So he cleans it off, and he's like, here, spit on that and clean it off. And I'm like, seriously? And he's like, yeah. And so I grab it, and he's like, he goes, watch. And he grabs another potato and pulls it up out of the ground, and he spits on it, and he washes it, spits on it again. And some of you are grossing out, all right? You'll be all right. So he, he washes it off, and he gets it, and he tosses it to me, and he's like, just take a bite. I'm like, it's a raw potato. He's like, you're hungry, aren't you? I was like, yeah. He's like, eat it. And I'm like, okay. I take a bite of this thing. I eat raw potatoes to this day. I love them. I love them. There's nothing like that grit in your teeth and that dirt. "Mm." My wife grosses out. She's peeling potatoes. I'm like, you're getting rid of the best part. And I'm eating them, and she's like, what are you doing? That's disgusting. And I'm like, me and Grandpa love them. If Grandpa would have thrown me a potato that wasn't prepared, I would have gagged. 
it would have been not, it would have been, it wasn't right. It would have been disgusting. It would have been nasty. And in that season, I was able to recognize all of his work to prepare that potato, all of his work in preparing what he knew when it was best to uplift and uproot that potato out of the field and give it to me. He knew that it wasn't going to hurt me. And he knew it would give me the sustenance that I needed to be able to do what I needed to do. So what does this look like for you? Whenever we look at these scriptures and we think about being patient, not grumbling, standing firm, leaning into the Lord is full of compassion and mercy whenever I don't see what's next and my life feels like there's, it's still loading. I need the information on the other side. Church, I just want to invite us into the space. Jesus is saying, be patient. I'm preparing you. And just like that potato comes up out of the field and is exactly what it needs to be and provides the resources my grandpa and grandma needed to make, to be able to make a living and move forward, Jesus wants us to know he hasn't forgot us. He sees your life. He sees your situation. Yeah, but inflation is on the rise. Jesus isn't surprised. Yeah, but I don't know what's going to happen with this new job if I'm going to get a raise or am I going to get that bonus. What does it look like for us in that tension to be patient, to anticipate that God has something ahead? Do you really believe that his return is something to hope for or do you see his return as something you're afraid of? Jesus wants you to have life and have it to the full, have abundant life in this world. You're like, well, you're not making my anxiety any easier right now. I get it. I've had those moments when I've woke up straight out of sleep full-on panic attack. Not knowing, feeling like somebody's sitting on my chest, not knowing what's going to happen. Church, I'm not just saying this is like, you just, just be patient. What I want you to hear is Jesus saying, be patient. I got you. Not, be patient. Do you see the difference? Jesus wants to restore what he's preparing underneath that we can't see. So here's my question for you. I want to invite the band forward this morning, and we're going to sing a song at the end here, and I want us to just stop and reflect on where do I need patience in my life? Where do I need to stand firm who am I grumbling about and what am I allowing to get me bent out of shape that I need Jesus to enter into that space and take control of my situation and stop looking at the glass half, half empty instead, half full? Where are we wanting the fruit without wisdom? Where are we wanting fruit without wisdom what suffering are you facing? Where are you being an example of patience in the face of suffering? And where do I need to trust the Lord that he is compassionate and merciful in this season? What is he preparing in you? God is doing a new thing in this season. And church, I want us to leave here today thinking about, God, what are you preparing? I want to lean into you and hear your voice speak to me. George Bernard Shaw said this, two things define you. Your patience when you have nothing and your attitude when you have everything. Your patience, what does it look like when we have nothing? And what does your attitude look like when you have everything? You see, a lot of times we are praying for God to show up. And when, you're, when you look at your life and you're looking at your suffering, I want to encourage you not to conclude that God is against you. I want you to conclude that God's doing something in you. And a lot of times we're just like, okay, my attitude is it's great whenever everything's good, but whenever it's bad, God, where are you? 
And it's in that season whenever things good, do you still turn to God and say, God, I love you. I see your blessing. Second Peter 3, 9 says this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. And as some understand slowness, instead he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And here's what God said to me many times in my time of patience. Jesus is trying to get my attention to stop, and there's some things that I need to surrender. There's some things in those moments of impatience where I find myself saying, God, I need to give these things over to you. And I'm quick to just be like, fix them, God, and I move on. And Jesus is saying, no. Listen to me, lean in. What do you need to repent of, Brian? Our teaching team was talking about this, and this was shared in the Wearsby commentary. He says this, for one, for one thing, they, they were in the will of God, yet they suffered. They were preaching in the name of the Lord, yet they were persecuted. Satan tells the faithful Christian that his suffering is the result of sin or unfaithfulness. And yet his suffering might well be because of faithfulness. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We must never think that obedience automatically produces ease and pleasure. Our Lord was obedient, and it led to a cross. Church, whenever we surrender our all to God, it doesn't mean that everything's just going to be beautiful. That everything's just going to turn out. What it means is our abundant life is not of this world. Our abundance and this, the life we live for is for a much greater eternal life that we get to experience now. How could Paul look at the very people who were going to kill him and the disciples all throughout who were persecuted? How could they look at other people and say, my God is good. And then they were murdered. And their lives were taken. And they left this earth in freedom because their life was not lived for this world. It was lived for a kingdom. Church, I want us to learn to be patient. I want us to learn to stand firm in our trial. What needs surrender to Jesus? As the worship team sings, I'm going to invite you to stand. I just want you to spend some time just reflecting. You don't have to sing if you don't want to. I just want this to be a space with you and Jesus. To be honest, I told the team this morning, I said, I, I wrote three different ways to land the plane today. I, I, I didn't know where Jesus wanted to take this this morning. I had three different ways, and I just, I feel like what God is saying here this morning is just like, what is it? that I'm all worked up about, that I'm struggling to be patient of, that I just need to repent of and surrender to Him. If that's you this morning, if you want to be brave and you just want to say, Brian, I'm struggling enough with this, I want to just publicly declare my faith that God is going to take what I'm trying to surrender and you just want to walk forward, we're not going to make you do anything weird. It's just a matter of you just walking forward publicly and saying, I'm surrendering this to God. If that's you, just come forward because they're singing.